and away we go. Intellectual pissing contest can now proceed. Yeah. <laughs> mm. So surfing for Patagonia. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, started surfing for Patagonia nine years ago. I was, uh, I was just getting out of high school and I was learning about the impact that where you put your money in banks um, can have on the environment. Um, it was this random project that I was doing as a senior in high school. Um, in 2007, uh, when you put your money into a bank, that money doesn't stay there. Um, banks lend your money out to underwrite various projects. This could be your local coffee shop, or it could be a coal-fired power plant halfway across the world. Um, and because of a law called fractional reserve lending, okay. banks can legally lend out many times more money than they have on deposit. Yeah. So if you put 10 bucks into a bank, that bank can legally lend out a, about 100 bucks. Oh, shit, really? Yeah, so it's this a very leveraged decision that we make. Um, you know, if you were to pick up a piece of plastic on the beach, it's not like that one piece of plastic now multiplies into 10 pieces. <laughs> yeah. um, and most of us don't think about where our money goes. Um, and depending on where you have your money, um, it could be going to fund some shit that you really don't want. So I did some research and I connected with an organization called Rainforest Action Network that's based up in San Francisco and they had a, a move your money campaign. Um, they were working to get people to move their money out of Bank of America, which is one of the largest um, underwriters of coal power in the Got world. It. So around that time, I, um, I loved surfing. I loved traveling. I knew that I wanted to create a life for myself where I could do that as much as possible and get paid to learn. Um, you know, like as, as a podcaster, you know, like <laughs> you get to receive these little micro degrees in random issues. And I always loved moving through life in that way. Um, so I remember I, I wrote on this big whiteboard with my mom, like what my life values were, what I wanted to do. Um, so surfing and okay, what company would be a company that could, that could align with all of these. So it was like thinking very big picture and then moving down from there. So Patagonia around the that time had um, just recently created a surf department. They're originally a, cl a climbing company and they, uh, they started making pitons. That was the first product that they, yeah, I think I knew that, that yeah. Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia created. Um, and I reached out to them, um, and I said, I want to talk to you about your banking practices. I'm a 17 year old <laughs> surfer from Santa Cruz. <laughs> um, and I had a, a mutual, f a, a friend of a friend knew Yvonne Chouinard, the founder. Um, and I was, I remember one evening I was surfing, um, at a local spot in Santa Cruz and I get this message on my phone. It says, hey, Kyle, this is Yvonne Chouinard uh, from Patagonia. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, yeah, it sounds really interesting, this whole banking <laughs> stuff. Let's talk about it. So he invited me down to his house in Ventura. Um, meanwhile, I'm like shitting bricks, 17-year-old kid. Like, oh, my God, he called me back. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, and I give him this spiel about how... Um, through leveraged action, when we put our money in local banks and credit unions, um, we can stop funding the problem and start funding the solution all in one move. Um, because when you put your money into a local bank or credit union, um, that money is also lent out, but it's lent out within your community. It's not getting sucked out halfway around yeah. the world. And he was really interested in it. And I said, well, uh, you know, I want $10,000 to go down to uh, Chile where there is this proposed coal power plant um, on this beach of this really great surf spot. It's this small fishing village down in central southern, southern Chile um, called Curenipe. And uh, I think that this could be a really great kind of a random story that uh, like, I'll go down there, I'll show this place where this coal plant's going to be proposed, and then tie it back to the banking system. And he was like... Um, well, here's a pair of board shorts. Like, get back to me in a little while. <laughs> like, damn it. Um, but I, uh, around that time, um, 
decided that I was going to learn how to uh, write a grant. Um, so I wrote a grant to this environmental foundation for $7,000. Um, I brought a friend of mine who's, uh, who was a professional photographer and videographer. He's now on staff at Surfer Magazine, which is one of the best uh, surf magazines in the world. His name is Ryan Craig. Um, and we went down to Chile together. But this was, you know, after a few months. I really did not know what I was doing. Like, thrown into the <laughs> frying pan with a camera. Uh, we went down to Chile. Uh, we documented the, the location. We interviewed locals. They were all against the coal power plant. Um, we interviewed a few bankers. Around that time, while I was, while I was down there, um, when, when we had finished the filming, I don't know why I did this, but this is back when we were shooting on um, mini, D, mini DV tapes. Yeah. I decided to put the tapes in a padded envelope and mail them back to myself because I was like, look, if this stuff gets jacked, like, everything is going to be gone. This is also, um, it, it should be note, noted, right when I was graduating high school, and I decided to go to an alternative college, which... Got it. My parents, I have great parents, great brothers and sisters, but it was a diversion from the normal path. Um, the college was called Gaia University, and they supported um, the students to go out and do real life projects like this, and you could get a degree from it. Um, so I mailed these tapes back. I get back to my house um, a week later after, after we'd been traveling a bit, and the envelope's on my bed, this padded envelope's on my bed. And I open it up, and all the tapes, all of the footage, had been crushed. Like, <laughs> steel toe boot style, <laughs> crushed. Yeah. My dad uh, is a, f a filmmaker, and he's also like the MacGyver of all MacGyvers. He goes to the flea market every Saturday and <laughs> gets broken shit and fixes it. He's like, all right, Kyle, we're going to get a, a, a pencil eraser and a screw gun, and we're going to wind the tapes back into, uh, into new tapes. I'm like, oh my God, this is not going to work. Um, and we did it, and, th and three out of the five tapes ended up working. We ended up making this YouTube video about that. Um, a lot of people ended up seeing it because I think that it was, there were a couple things that we had going for it. One was, was just the randomness of it. Some 18 year old kid, uh, talking about the banking system. Um, and the second was that it was in 2008, right when the financial collapse happened. Yeah, that makes sense. So this is the first time in a long time that people were paying attention to banking, at, were paying attention to where their money was because a lot of it was gone. Um, so that video went out and about, and I started getting emails from uh, people who de decided to move their money into local banks and credit unions, started getting um, emails from companies that were moving their money as a result of this video, and uh, it kind of caught fire in this way where we documented um, a lot of money being moved out of Bank of America as a result. Um, so then I went back after that to Patagonia and said like, hey, you know, this is, this is <laughs> what I can do. Um, so they then started to support me more and more incrementally. And from that became um, the Surfing for Change series, um, which is a series that I've hosted and produced for the last seven years. Um, and the, the theme of it is that I go around to surf spots around the world um, and I cover environmental issues. And then, so I stopped doing that last year to um, make the jump to podcasting. Nice, man. Yeah. You know, something you said there that I thought was really great, and that's that you you sat down you, with your mom, which is incredible, by the way, and laid out what you want to do, your values, and different ways you could approach that. And really, I mean, you did have some, like hiccups along the way, too. Like, you got a pair of board shorts instead of the 10000 bucks. Oh, it's always hiccups. And, then, and, and you also didn't know what the fuck you were doing. Yeah. Like, all these things. And that's usually those are deterrents for people, especially a 17, 18 year old kid, like trying to figure that out. Like, that's completely disheartening. And you had the mindset to, to approach that. Damn, dude, that's really impressive. Um, thanks. Yeah. I, I think that we make 10 or 15 really big decisions in life before we realize that we're grown ups. Hundred <laughs> percent. And if we can recognize early on that that 
the values with which we move through life and getting to know ourselves a little bit better, which I've, I've listened to a few of your podcasts and really respect you for doing that. You, you continuously force people to move through the layers and con- continuously force people to um, have their sense of self-worth not be externally located. Yeah. I appreciate that, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, and that's the goal too. It's like, it, there's so much value in understanding yourself, understanding your, your values. Like that's what really drives you. Cause it, or what's an agreement that you made with a, a no unbeknownst to you. Yeah. And that's really, really wild. I actually released the, the podcast that'll come out before this one is about, you know, understanding your biases that you may carry through life that are unknown and just a little bit of self-reflection will expose you to those. And that's, it's challenging, but those are really challenging hurdles to come over as well. But you, you're absolutely right. There's like 10 or 15 <laughs> big decisions that you'll make. And a lot of those will be mistakes. And a lot of those will leave you f- flat on your face. Yeah. But you got to pick yourself back up. And then that builds resilience, you know, and resilience, you, you can have the option to, to take resilience or take resentment. Like you really, that's, that's the thing. You have a fork in the road whenever you come to those places. And it's super, super powerful just to be able to, to pick it up and put it back together. Yeah. I, th- people don't. <laughs> no one tells you when you're young that when you start something new, you're just going to suck at it for a while. <laughs> yeah. And if you can go through life with that understanding, okay, I'm going to start something new and I'm going to suck at it for a while. I'm going to eat shit again and again and again. And then eventually I'm going to wake up and be like, oh, I can, I can do this now. Um, we wouldn't have such a brittle relationship with learning. Yes. Um, around that time, I read a book that influenced me a huge amount called The Art of Learning by a guy named Josh Waitzkin. Uh, do you know who that is? Yeah, I love that book. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and I think that it, it, it provided a framework for me to um, learn about shit and be okay with saying, oh, I don't know. Yeah. I say I don't know a lot. And I... <laughs> in my line of work, I, I, as I say, I make documentaries about... Um, various issues that I know very little about. And I sit at tables many times that I have no business being at. So I better be get very good at being comfortable with not knowing. Yeah. I mean, I work a lot with people that go through things like that, right? Where they feel in over their head or they feel like they're not qualified or they're the fear of failure or fear of success, whichever one you want to, whichever one you want to pick, they're kind of the same thing. But you have to be able to anchor into what your intentions are. Like confidence is confidence, right? So if you understand that your intentions going into something like that are to add value and to learn and to you know, fill in the blank, whatever those things are that you want to carry into those interactions, well, then you have confidence in that. And then being wrong isn't such a big deal because then it's still in alignment with your intention to learn. Yeah. You know, Mark Manson does a great job of explaining that. I just read his book. I the love it. Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck? Yeah. Oh, game changer, man. The guy's a fantastic writer. So I've been thinking about something recently. I would love to hear your perspective on this um, around learning and failure. Um, so I just did a writing retreat with um, Chris Ryan, mm-hmm. who wrote Sex at Dawn. Um, and we took his van down to Baja and um, I had to write uh, a story for a magazine and he was finishing his book, Civilized to Death. And on the way back, we um, we stopped at a Denny's and we we're eating breakfast. And, <laughs> and he looks up to me, uh, up at me and goes, Kyle, what do you think your biggest failure is? I'm like, <laughs> eating my eggs. <laughs> and I'm like, I thought about it for a while and I said, I think the biggest failure of my life was the story that I did after that first banking story. Um, I was riding on all this success from this, this story. We, I got to give a, a TEDx talk. There was a media all around mm-hmm. the country. And um, I thought that I just like had the golden touch of filmmaking, not realizing <laughs> how, how uh, much timing had to do with that success. And I, so after that, I, did a bunch of fundraising to do a story in Sri Lanka on the um, changing working conditions in the garment industry as a result of consumer pressure. So the first one was on where you bank. The second one was, was going to be on the buying choices that we make. Um, so it took a ton of time to raise this money, to go to Sri Lanka. Um, it was a very slow process to make this second um, story happen. I, and I still really hadn't done the work of of just doing bad movies for a little while like this was <laughs> yeah. this was the second piece i had ever done yeah. and i pre-produced it for like a year and then i went to sri lanka it was a 
cool experience. Very few people saw the movie. When I look back at it, I'm like, oh, God, that was not that good. Um, and I had wasted like a year, a year and a half of my life. And I, so I, at that table, I said, I think the biggest failure I've ever had was my slowest failure. Mm. And he looked at me, he's like, yeah, you know, I've like this book that I'm coming out with, uh, Civilized to Death, like it could be this great success or it could be this horrible failure, but it's taken me so long to write it too. I feel like that could be my biggest failure too. Yeah. And I liked the way that, that we thought about it in that context, like fail quickly, <laughs> whatever it is that you're going to do, just fail quickly at it. Yeah. I think that's one thing that's really important to recognize there is, is sometimes disillusionment is the biggest failure. You know, it's like you ha you've had success and you've had the things that you think you wanted and those things don't even scratch the itch, you know? So it's like, Oh, I, I got what I thought I wanted and now I'm completely disillusioned because what do I even want now? You know, that's a, to me, that's a huge failure that comes with persisting without, without awareness into something that you don't understand fully, you know, which is yourself. But I think failing fast is super important when you can, if you can have the amount of self-awareness to like go into something and know when things are with resistance and what's the universal kind of warning signs about something, it can be completely different. If that makes any sense. What do you think has been the biggest failure in your life? Uh, the slowest one. The slowest one. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, what's been the slowest So failure? it's funny that you say that because it's on the heels of being really great at something accidentally. So I, I, I started coaching, coaching CrossFit and fitness and strength and conditioning. I mean, I was a personal trainer in college and I loved that. And it was kind of a part-time gig at the rec center and we got paid like 15 bucks an hour, but I had a blast and I met a bunch of great people and I loved interacting with people. And, and I, since I was, you know, I played football in college a little bit and got injured. And then through that injury, I started understanding kind of, uh, the body more. Right. So I started thinking about how the body works. Cause I had been told I could never like lift weights again, like off the ground. And I was like, well, I'm not going to accept that. So I'm going to figure something else out started reading. And that's what got me into reading. That's what got me into understanding psychology even. And so from there it was naturally went into coaching CrossFit like as an internship at a gym before I graduated college. And then just just ran into that full, full on. And I was great at it. I was really, really good at it to the point where there was like people, older people that I worked with that I'd started making more money than or getting more opportunities than because I would lock myself in a room when, instead of driving home to save money. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to like waste gas money driving home. I'd stay in the office of the gym and take a nap. And then I'd watch some of, some of my favorite coaches on YouTube with the sound off to understand how they use their mannerisms to display a message shit like that. Like that's what I was doing when I was 22. Right. So I got really good, really fast and I was very genuine about it. And I let that get to me. So I coached for, and I was super entitled because I'd been so good from the jump. I didn't have to suck that much. I sucked a little bit at the beginning, but not that bad. And then I was like, well now, you know, I'm, I'm rolling, I'm rolling, you know, <laughs> rolling through this thing. I'm going to open my own gym. Didn't ask the right questions, put a year into putting it all together at least you know, signed a lease that was a terrible idea and didn't ask the right questions there, didn't, didn't consult my mentors and ended up losing money and the thing failed. And it was my first big, like massive, oh shit, I failed at something. And I had to wrap my mind around that and completely just unplugged afterwards. But that, and even to this day, like it catapulted me into so many other things because it made me understand the process more. Because that's, that, you see that with professional athletes and stuff all the time, they're just good. And they get to where everybody's good. And then it's like, oh, well, now, now the work matters. Now the process matters. And a lot of people miss out because of that. Yeah. And it's funny that the biggest failures come on, come on the heels of some really great success. Yeah. Almost like accidental success. <laughs> Was there a point where you uh, were lying to other people about the failure of it? Like I f a lot of times I find that we can kind of see our lives start to slip in one way or another, but especially people... Uh, who have a public presence mm -hmm. still try and clamor on be like, no, it's going great. It's killer. <laughs> like, oh, it's a CrossFit gym. <laughs> Best yet. Yeah. We're going to open three more next year. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think I lied with my words. Right. But I definitely think, you know, I didn't want to put out there like, oh, you know, there's like a lot of legal stuff going on. I mean, it was all behind, like my clients didn't really know. Like the client experience was actually 
really good. I had really great retention. It's just the whole time I was opening a gym and my business partner, her, her father had been diagnosed with ALS. So she wasn't really present. And a lot of things came up that were just unexpected. So I didn't put that out there to my clients, a couple of them, like my girlfriend at the time knew what was going on. And it just, it, the gym needed a hundred percent of me and it was getting like 60% because the other 40% of emotional energy was going into like dealing with, you know, potentially having to close this thing or getting, you know, having to go into a lawsuit, like all this other stuff. So, but I was really, I think the, the big learning there was that I, I did bring a really solid version of myself to all of my classes and all of my clients Yeah, and the people that knew, but from the outside looking in, it did look really good. You know, I made that, I made that, I, I did the best I could to make it look like what it was, which it was a good little gym. It just didn't, it just, there was, you know, circumstances that I didn't, and that I did totally put on myself. And the big practice for me was understanding like, this is, I'm not a victim here. Like I didn't ask the right questions. I didn't, you know, I didn't take my lease to a lawyer. That's so stupid. You know, that was me living in fantasy, living in delusion. Like that's me, you know, that's me taking someone's word for something that I don't even really know. <laughs> like, there's yeah. so many learnings there. Yeah. You but, strike me as a kind of person who can separate, um, like if you're having a super stressful day or if things are crumbling at the gym, you can still show up for class mm. and bring that and say, yeah. all right, I'm here for this next hour. We're doing this. And that, and some people can't, like some people will show up and, uh, they'll be coaching a class and be like, all right, let's get after it guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing about it too. Though, it's really similar to the I'm podcast. Great. I'm fine. I, I don't cry. I work out. <laughs> I don't cry. I'm still crying and coaching. Yeah. I mean, that's what I did. I actually was, I think I was always pretty good at that. Like it, I didn't think about the time that I was coaching the class as my time. It was their time. Right. They paid for that time and I could bring the I could muster up the best version of myself for that class. Even if I wasn't super present, I could still bring a positive attitude, you know, and be but I always was so authentic though too. It was it, it put me in a flow state, so it wasn't that hard. I mean, even the podcast, you know, the, you know how it is to start a podcast. There's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. But when I put the headsets on and like things get going, like I love this shit. So it doesn't what, the, me being I'm not faking being having a great time having a conversation with you right now even though my receiver broke. Right. <laughs> I had to like figure some stuff out over the past 24 hours. Like it's all good. Yeah. Cause I get to do this, you know, and I, and I found gratitude for that early, you That's know, cool. and I've been lucky that I've been able to do really do something I love for most of my life. You know, and I've had enough shitty jobs that I know what they're like <laughs> for just long enough to figure it out. But you know, I get to do things that I love and I, and I understand just like Jordan Peterson says, like we, cho- we choose our sacrifices. That's one of the most beautiful things about life. Not that you can have it all, but that you can choose what you don't have in the service of something that you truly want. That's truly in alignment with yourself. I like that a lot. Yeah. I, uh, around that book that I mentioned earlier, the art of learning by Josh Waitskin, he talks about these two different kinds of learners and something that you were just mentioning. Um, entity learners versus learning theorists. Um, entity learners tend to be people who are naturally good at shit. Yeah. Um, you being one of them, right? So it can, it can create this kind of brittle relationship with learning because all of a sudden you're not a big fish in a small pond and you get around a bunch <laughs> of other athletes and you need to re-examine what is my work ethic? How good am I willing to get? And what you end up getting is like these people who aren't, weren't naturally good at stuff, but have a really solid relationship with learning who tend to rise to the top. So it's good that you had that experience because it sounded like it forced you to re-examine. It's not like we are one type or another, but it, 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 forcing ourselves to examine the process of learning, um, is ultimately what allows us to get better. Yeah. And acknowledging failure for what it is, I think is huge too. That was when I said the word, like the gym failed. I said those words like, and like, okay, that hurt a stings. I feel that in my solar plexus like knots up and it's like, okay, that means I failed. Yeah. Like I failed to, to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. But that's just me being honest with myself. Like I don't need to dress it up and be like, oh, everything happens for a reason. Like don't get hung up on the past. <laughs> it's like I can do, there's, there's places for that, but you're just bypassing fucking reality sometimes. Man, I, uh, I I wasn't expecting you to say this story, but you, you just brought something up up for me uh, around naming it and saying it out loud. Yep. So last weekend, I was camping with a few friends, and um, we all took mushrooms and went down to the beach and had a great day. Thanks for the invite, dude. Yeah, sorry. About <laughs> that. Next time. Next time. Um, and... I'm guessing most people who listen to this podcast are open to the idea that psychedelics can be very helpful when used 
with the right mindset and also in the right setting. Um, and there was uh, a, f- a friend of mine there who um, it was it was his first time taking psychedelics. Um, he was, and he was really excited and open to it, but also you know had the nervousness of like, yeah. oh, I've never done this before. Um, and we took, we ate the mushrooms. He didn't take that much. We got back to the campsite. The sun was starting to go down. Um, he took a little more and then all of a sudden I could see him kind of click into this. Whoa, this is, this is, it, things are starting to look pretty interesting. <laughs> uh, and we were all setting up the campsite and I could tell it was starting to get pretty intense for him. And I said, Hey, you, let's go for a walk right now. Let's go for a little walk. And, and we start walking down this pathway. Um, and I, and he was trying to intellectualize how he was feeling in the moment. He's the kind of guy who like, all right, like control. And I, oh, wow, this is, I'm seeing some, uh, bright sunshine right here. And wow, this is really interesting. I said, you know what? Let's just not talk <laughs> for 10 minutes. Let's walk and let's talk. All right. And, and let's, let's just be in silence. Let's walk and let's, let's be in silence. So we start noticing the birds chirping. We start noticing the sun flickering through the trees. And we stop at this one, this one huge white tree. And we look at the ants making their pathway up. And and I could tell he started to really sink in to that frequency um, and started to feel that pulsing of the earth that we tend to feel when we use psychedelics. And... uh, we hung out there for about 15 minutes and then we were walking back to camp and he saw this woman who looked at him and smiled and he smiled back at her and he looked at me and said, the first thing I think when people look at me is how do I look? How are they perceiving me? And I've always done that my whole life. And I said, well, what do you think, uh, what do you think it created that? And he said, well, I come from this um, evangelical Christian family and I've always felt very judged by them. I've always felt like I was the one who needed to keep the family together. And I've always felt like my sense of self-worth was externally located. Like I had to like get this, I had to do something to, to earn their love. And I said, well, like, I'm just, we're walking. I'm like, who's, whose love do you think it was um, that you felt like you had to earn? And he looks over at me and he just starts sobbing like <laughs> deep, like, <gasps> <gasps> and we just sit down on this rock and man, he cried in my arms and it was, it was all about his relationship with his father. And I said, do you feel like you're deserving of love? And he said, yeah, I do. I said, well, what? say it. Like, say it. And he, and he said, I'm deserving of love. I'm like, say it again. He's like, I am fucking deserving of love right now. And that is not dependent on who I become or the shit that I do. And it, it was one of the most beautiful experiences I've had ever, man. To, I mean, because we all talk about psychedelics and how helpful they can be. But to see it so personally with, with a friend in that context, it was so unexpected for, for him that it was, that was going to come out. He expected to take some mushrooms and have a groovy day at the beach. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he's going through 10 years of therapy <laughs> in an hour. Um, and it was the result of him saying it. And naming that statement, just as you said, naming the statement of the gym failed and how powerful that can be to put it out in the world. Yeah, language is such a powerful piece. And psychedelics just put that, they put that inner critic, particularly mushrooms, which are my my go-to in that that place. But they put the inner critic aside for just a moment. You can just get a glimpse of like, yourself from a step away and just like see your life for a second just outside of it, especially when you're in nature. Man, that's that's beautiful, dude. That's that's incredible. I love that. Yeah, I got, I got chills when you're telling me that for sure. I mean, I, I had a similar experience with my, my ex girlfriend when we were in Peru, and I'd taken Wachuma, which is the San Pedro cactus, um, and it's brewed in a special way with uh, Don Howard from Spirit Quest down there, and it's a it's an incredible place. They built it around the jungle, like minimally invasive, and it's it's just wild. And and Wachuma is like nine hours, right? But it's it's kind of like mushrooms and, and MDMA if you kind of mix them together, but in a such a grounded way 
And we had been in this like clay bottom pool swimming around with a bunch of our friends. We down, went down there with Aubrey Marcus. That's actually where the name Pleasure Monkey came from because he saw the Pleasure Monkey in his in his first ayahuasca trip that we were on down there. And uh, it was funny that we took called it the Pleasure Monkey trip. And then when it came time to name the podcast, of course, I adopted it for the show. But um, we were walking and I'd walked off into the woods after we'd gotten out of the water. And, and there were some people from the local tribe that were selling some jewelry and stuff. And um, it was really great. It was really cute, but I just kind of wanted to be by myself and I was walking out and I could see waves. I, like I could see the trees communicating with each other, like waves in the canopy of the trees. And it was just, life was everywhere. And I was just seeing what life was. And I was by myself kind of down this little trail and, uh, and I'm sitting there and I kind of hear something behind me. I turn around and, and live my girlfriend at the time was walking behind me and we'd probably been together for like four or five months at the time. So it's a lot for people in kind of a new relationship. And she walks up and she's like smiling and she hugs me and just starts breaking down crying. Like just bawling, bawling. And it was, I didn't, she didn't have to say a word. I just knew like what was going on. You know, like she could let go for the first time. She had spent so much of her life like propping herself up and being to be perceived a certain way. And it come from a world where that was the standard. And she was so scared of death for some reason, like death like freaked her out, you know, and it still does a little bit, but she started to see how fast life turns over in the jungle. And like, I was looking at communication and connection and she was just feeling the turnover of, of trees and animals and how it just, that's just the cycle of life. And like, I guess me being kind of in that place, kind of grounded her out and she could just let go. And it was to this this day, like one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. It's actually when I told her I loved her for the first time. It was like that was that moment, like tears covering both of our faces and just being in that place. And it was, I wouldn't trade that moment for anything. Yeah. It's the, the, the plant teachers, man, are just some, there's something else. I don't like the word bad trip. Uh, no, no. I find that most people who have bad trips are having a difficult trip and they're not like my friend who, who was very brave for opening up in that moment and meeting it head on this really frightening and very personal moment. Um, probably would have had a bad trip if he would have tried to box that shit in a dark corner. Mm-hmm. Like, no, I'm going to have a good time. This is going to be fun. This is fucking great. <laughs> this is going to be what I wanted to yeah, be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to control the shit out of this mushroom. I'm going to get in a headlock and take it down the ground. <laughs> that's that yeah the resistance is what causes the fight you don't have to you can't fight i mean i had that my second ayahuasca experience was what if i explained it to you without the ending it would be like that was a terrible experience and i i came into this just dark just pure darkness with this big dark entity and it was like i have your dad and i have your brother and i've had people from before you were even born like just like your whole lineage i own them i was like all right, let's go motherfucker. (laughs) I'm going to fight this thing. And for three hours, I'm sitting in this chair, just like trying to fight this big ball of darkness for forever. And I'm sweating and I'm shaking and no purging or anything like that. in that, in that trip. Uh, but at the end of it, I'm just, by the time in my vision, I, I wasn't, I was physically exhausted, but in my vision, I was just like, I was done. I had nothing left. I was just broken down, like in the fetal position. And then my dad and my brother show up. And my dad was like my age. So he was, it was weird. It was like a young version of my dad and my brother who's a year younger than me. And we just hugged and started crying in my trip. And then we just let everything go. And the trip, boom, over, done. Like the, I was not on ayahuasca anymore. It was weird. It was just like, poof, just dissolved. And I was like, oh, you can't fight this stuff. You can't, you gotta love, you just gotta love through it, you know, and embrace what it is and understand that it's there. And it was, it was wild. I actually saw my dad. So my dad's in prison. He's been in prison for five years now. Oh, wow. He's got on a seven year sentence. And it was the first time I'd seen him in three years was the weekend after that. And I was talking to him through glass. And I remember looking at him through the glass and feeling like I was looking into a mirror. And I was like, oh. I mean, he wasn't even really around when I was growing up. I mean, I spent summers with him sometimes, but not enough to really like nature versus nurture, like raise me, right? That's was raised my grandparents. And I remember seeing him and being like, Oh, we're so much the same. Like if I would have been born in the same situation you were born in, I'd be right where you are right now. And I fully knew that and accepted that. And the amount of empathy I could have from that moment was incredible. Why is he in prison? Uh, meth. Meth. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's, it, you know, he was born, his, you know, his mom's kind of crazy. He didn't have a dad. He doesn't know who his dad is. And he's a super charismatic guy. Like if you hung out with him, you would never know, but he just always had an addict, addiction problem. And, and then, uh, he would fall into hard, hard times and he would just, I think he was a runner mostly. So they had a big crackdown in my hometown, small town in Texas. There's a lot of that kind of stuff. And 
it's yeah. so sad that we treat medical issues as criminal issues. Yeah. Yeah, we have 4% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prisoners. We have more prisoners here than any other country. Yeah. And, um, and it's, it's clearly a mental health issue. It's right? so it's clearly so, a mental like, health issue. And then we get people you know, for, for, uh, low crimes and, and then we just get them in the system, we get yeah. them in the system and, and there's no way out. And I think that, I mean, it's a form of slavery that it we is. do not acknowledge. Um, I'm, I'm going to get a guy named Michael Wood on my podcast. Who's the, the um, Aubrey. I just had him on the show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's a, um, it's a fantastic a, episode. De- uh, yeah. He's a detective. And he's writing a book about it and it just blows the door open on this really dark corner of society that we need to reexamine because as you said, like empathy is what we need more of in yeah. this world. And it's so easy for us to believe that they're throwaway people. Yeah. It's so it's wild and dude, it's just people are people, man. If you can't see the homeless guy on the corner and put yourself in their shoes, like try. Yeah. Try. Just even trying will be something that that will that will blow your mind. Yeah. Because you don't know you don't know anybody's story but your own. The only person you really truly know is yourself if you're lucky. And it's it's wild, man. Like it's so it's we turn it we turn a blind eye to it. We get conditioned to see people through that lens and it's, it's a, condi- it's a conditioning piece. It's a patterning piece. You know, I mean, you think the same thing happened and, and really if you want to look at it and this is something that Jordan Peterson talks about is, is it's the same thing happened in Germany during the Nazi era. Like people just went along their day. If they weren't Jews and they weren't being persecuted, they just, they just had to turn a blind eye to it. They came it, for the Jews, but I wasn't Jewish. So I didn't say anything. Yeah. And yeah. It's, um, it's wild. I mean, I, get, I just watched Inglorious Bastards again for the first time the other day. Right. And that's one thing that I really, an empathy piece that I look at. I mean, I remember the, one of my favorite scenes in that movie is when Farb the Bear Jew, like just kills the guy with the bat. Right. And you see it and you're like, I remember looking at that and going like, I have the capacity to do that to somebody in the right circumstances under the right conditions. I have the capacity inside of me as a human animal to do that to somebody. That's really crazy to think about, but you do. Everyone does. Yeah. And then at the same time, it's like you have the capacity to be a Nazi as well. Like that's a dark part of the human nature, the human animal that exists. And if you can't understand, if you can't fully embrace that shadow side of yourself that does exist inside of you, then you're limiting yourself in the light. It's a full spectrum, but you have to acknowledge that to experience the other side of it fully. Because the more acknowledgement, the more awareness you have of yourself in reality and what you actually are and who you actually are, why you actually are, then you can see more light. You can feel more love. Yeah. And putting yourself in those intense experiences, the experiences, whether it's with a homeless person that makes you feel really uncomfortable or putting yourself in a very difficult physical uh, experience. I, um, I love putting myself in intense physical places like, um, I sur- uh, like surfing big waves. Yeah. I feel like it's this accelerated learning program where it gets me right to the edge of my discomfort and I'm forced. It's like this accelerated self-actualization process. Like I, and, and saying yes and, and saying no and knowing when there is a point to step back from it. Yeah. Like I, I, um, I'll tell you a story that I've learned a ton about myself in just recently I was uh, so last week Mavericks was as big as it gets um, Mavericks is this this big wave up in Northern California that um, is very famous and can get waves can come in as big as 70 feet there damn um, and it only gets big a few times a year so when you get it you really want to get it um, and it's uh, the way I would describe big wave surfing is that you um, you only have so much energy in a session, and when you fall on a really big wave, um, you need to really let go. And and when you when you do have a few different um, times that you fall, like your energy really gets drained. So yeah. you want so you need to be careful about like how close to this do I really want to go? And and taking those. Um, I know I feel I feel like I kind of just like took took it this way, but I, there's a metaphor here that I swear I'm gonna we're gonna find the metaphor. We're gonna dig, it out for we're sure. gonna dig the metaphor out. I, I, I didn't just totally <laughs> to big wave surfing, but it was it was it, it's around um, pushing yourself towards discomfort. I think that that's that is the the theme here. But last week it was as big as Mavericks gets, um, and. 
I went out in a boat with a few other surfers um, who were uh, re- these really great big wave surfers um, mm-hmm. from all around the world. And we showed up and the water was calm for a moment. And then all of a sudden we saw this set break 300 yards outside of the bowl. These are, there's a wave of probably 60 feet waves Damn. on the face, like a, an avalanche of water coming at us. And I've never been out in conditions at Mavericks where I said, like, this is too big for me. This is too dangerous. And we didn't have our own safety team in place because we have jet skis usually in place that will uh, will take care of us. And there were jet skis there, but we didn't we didn't take it um, or, or we didn't uh, we didn't have our own safety team. And the other surfers had traveled from halfway around the world. So they were out there no yeah. matter what they were going. And I was sitting on this boat and I was watching these waves come in. I thought to myself, don't be stupid. Like, this is just, this is too much for you right now. Like, this is, this is an experience where you can't, you really can take it too far. You can, like, you can push it too far, and the consequences are very real. And uh, I ended up staying on the boat and not surfing that day. And it came back in, and I felt so okay about it. <laughs> no, I've been thinking about that session like since that experience. And because I think like you and I are people who like we like to push it. Like yeah. we like to oh, I want to like get to the whether it's drinking a bunch of ayahuasca and finding out who we really are <laughs> and getting into these dark corners yeah. of like, whoa, okay, okay, here we are. To physical experiences. But knowing where that edge is, too, and knowing when we need to take it back down, I think can be just as important as a, of a lesson. Um, because we can get our identities too attached to, the, to being the kind of person who just continues to push it. And that only ends in a kind of handful of ways. You know, that, that Jamie Wheel talks about that and Stephen Kotler in their books about stealing fire and the rise of Superman. It's like when you're chasing flow like that, so you see these, like, there's, how many how many free soloists are there still around? One, really. Like, all the greats are dead. You know, it's like, that's how it, you can take it too far when you've, you've, you've pushed that limit so many times. It's, it's wild, man. It is a wild thing for action sports, especially. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever feel like there is, uh, you have those experiences in your life where, like, you're pushing, you're pushing, you're pushing, and then, like, you get that little... I, there's a difference between moving through nerves and excitement and not recognizing warning signs. Yeah. Not, I don't do enough things that are that, that have a lot of risk associated with them aside from like bodily injury. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, training was like that for me, like CrossFit training a lot. Cause there were some things that were relatively dangerous. I think it, I think it became more like, what am I sacrificing to do this again? Like to pull it back to like you choose your sacrifices. Like am I choosing my sacrifices appropriately? Right. Like if you're a big wave surfer and that's who you are and that's your identity, and you got to get off the boat, but that's not you, you know, the same way with training. Like, what am I doing with myself? Like, is this, is this the sacrifice I want to make for this thing? Is it worth it for me? You know, and that was, so for me, like that was backing off of something I was always going to be good enough at to be good and never be great at, mm. never be good enough for myself to be right. So it's like, even if I, even if I had it all, it's like practice I do with myself sometimes. I'm like, okay, I'm going down this path. If it goes as perfectly as it possibly can, am I going to feel fulfilled in it? And if the answer is no, then I usually reassess the entire situation. You know, that's how it was with training. Like I was I'm a big guy. Like I wasn't ever going to go to the, the CrossFit games. And I was like, even though I won the CrossFit games, would that actually make me happy? You know, like all that is, is like that's four hours a day for the next five years of training to maybe get on a team and maybe, do, you know, it's like, but is that going to fulfill me? Like, no. <laughs> so what, what am I, is that the sacrifice I want to make for myself? And that's kind of how, that's kind of how I look at it. But there are things like, I'm like, okay, I really want, you know, I really want to get back on a dirt bike again. You know, there's some certain things and I'm like, all right, like I know that I know that goes down, that goes down a slippery, slippery slope to like, this could be a real, it's going to be super fun. I'm going to love it just like I did when I was a kid. <laughs> but that's one of the best parts about growing up, yeah. isn't it? Like we learn more about where our edge is. Yes. And w- like when we're kids, like when I was a kid, I, um, I wanted to be a pro skater. And I, my identity was very much tied to being the kid that would go for it and do it. I would hurl myself off of 12 stairs and off of roofs. And the, I was like the guy who was just like, all right, I'm going to do it. And yeah, you know, I was made of rubber so I could pull it off. And um, 
then I broke my arm skating. Is that where your, is yeah, that where your scar's from? Big scar from. Broke it three times skating. Had to get three surgeries. Compound fractures. Damn. Got metal in there. And all of a sudden, I had to pause and reevaluate how far I really wanted to push it. And I had a few friends who were also pro skaters um, who's n- now, they kept pushing it and their bodies are wrecked. Yeah. And I, as you say, choosing your sacrifices, like l- learning where that edge is and how it is that you can enjoy life most and not destroying yourself in the process because the consequences are real. <laughs> yeah. And when you acknowledge death, as you do, and I'd love to talk with you more about death, yeah. uh, one of my favorite subjects. Yeah, everybody loves to talk about um, death. <laughs> but we can go, we, we can look at activities through a more sober lens. And when we ex- when we experience people around us who die too, and you and you really get that sense of like, whoa, this could happen to me. It forces you to pause and reevaluate sometimes. Yeah, and that's something base jumping has been super like intriguing to me. Mm. I've never skydived. Like, and I'm, I'm like, I've, I've made this commitment and I got into a huge argument with my ex-girlfriend about this. I was like, I don't want to ever skydive tandem. And I've wanted to do it recently. Like I've been really called to do it for some reason. Right. And I'm like, I just want to go, I want to go solo the first time. Like they have a guy that when you jump out, they have, well, you've guy. never skydive. Never at all. Go with, why, why not go tandem for the first time? I don't time? know. It just doesn't, it just, I don't know why. I think it's just one of those things. Like it, it maybe it's, it's most likely an ego thing, but they, they had the option to not go tandem. You just have to spend a half a day. And I'm like, I think that'd be awesome. And somebody jumps with you and does, like you essentially are tandem. Like you have a, you have a right. instructor going okay, with you. Okay. So that is an option. Yeah. So they, they, they take you out. You jump out of the plane with somebody else and they kind of hold you and show you what's up, but they're not attached to you. Right. And that to me, I'm like, I don't know why, but that just seemed like, it just seemed like it would be a big move for me. Like I would, that would be overcoming something. And I wanted to do that. And it was like, why take the extra risk? I'm like, I don't know, but I just feel called to do it. I think it's, everything's going to be fine. I mean, I have confidence in that, but when it comes to stuff like that or like going base jumping and stuff, it's like, if I'm going to do that, if I'm going to jump off of a cliff or jump off of a bridge or get a, you know, get a bike that does 200 miles an hour, it's like, am I okay dying doing that? Really? And like, that's, that's, that's possible if not likely, you know, like I think some of the guys that squirrel suit, like all those guys die. It's like, I don't, if you're doing that, you have to accept that. You have to say that it's, it's worth it, you know? It's a, it's a crazy conversation to have with yourself because that's the reason I, that's the reason I don't have a, a motorcycle right now is I'm like, it's not worth me dying on one right now. I don't know why that is. It's such a weird, that's just the way I look at it. And it's like, it's such a strange thing, but it's like, let me embrace it for what it really is. Like, is, is the juice worth the squeeze? Yeah. You know? Yeah. You also need to recognize though, that you could die on your way to go <laughs> base jumping in a car. Exactly. Yeah. But w- we don't recognize that as yeah. a danger, even though it's a huge danger that we all accept yeah. um, every single day. It's important though, to, to figure out where you can mitigate risk within mm-hmm. a dangerous activity. There are a few different types of big wave surfers and some are ones who just say, fuck it, I'm going. <laughs> and they go straight and get blown up by 40 feet of white water. And that's just them. There are other big wave surfers. These are the ones who I really respect who are calculated. They're ones who in that moment of intensity can make decisions in a rational way. And they're okay saying, no, I'm not going to go on this wave. And when the, the wave comes that they really want, they commit and they go and they usually make it. Yeah. So that is like, that's the tightrope that we want to walk when we're doing these dangerous activities. It's, it's not about doing it in an, an irresponsible way. It's mm. about recognizing risk. Um, and I do my best whenever I'm out surfing big waves to recognize what the risks are and go through in my mind what I'm going to do if that situation presents itself. If you are out surfing big waves and you haven't thought about (laughs) what your totem is going to be mentally when you get sucked 20 feet below the ocean and the, and it's not letting you go and you're in a very dark, lonely place, you're going to freak out. So mentally being able to think, okay, I'm going to go here. This is, this is my happy place. This is the situation that um, eat when my mind just wants to go, fuck, 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 what are you doing? <laughs> you're gonna go, no, no I'm going to go here to this waterfall and there's going to be a naked woman laying below the waterfall and there's going to be a chill breeze. 
ha- I, I swear, it. man, no, I having it. I that it. shit is it's super ha- important. Happy Gilmore happy place. Yeah. <laughs> Your own happy place. <laughs> Um, but isn't that isn't that the metaphor for life though? When you take risks, right? When you go to do a thing, it's like you might again to coming back to failure. Like you might fail, right? Like most situations in life that you take where you take a risk won't suck you twenty feet under under a wave. But you could you could end up in a dark place. Yeah. And where are you going to go? Have you practiced that? Have you thought about it? Or are you just like you know twiddling your thumbs and going along hoping for the best? Yeah. And what an empowering experience to go through a big failure, whether it's being sucked down. 20 feet underwater or a part of an ayahuasca trip where you're in a really dark place and moving through that, Mm -hmm. like that can give you just as much confidence as making the wave or more confidence or having this really blissful psychedelic experience doesn't necessarily give you, provide the mental fortitude that it would have if you had the dark experience. And the really blissful ayahuasca experiences are funny. They almost like set you up, like give you some trust in the medicine. (laughs) I mean, my first one was extremely blissful. Like, was, I've, I've worked out all my shit. I'm perfect. <laughs> I'm on to the other side. It was funny, man. The first, the first one, so I did three nights in a row the first time. And the first one I felt, I was kind of scared and freaked out. There's lots of noises and they kind of, it just, everybody was like, there was somebody laughing and crying and purging. And I'm just like, it was a lot, you know? And I felt this big, like wave of like tingly love, you know? And I felt like the mother, like the divine mother, as they say, was like spooning me. And she was whispering in my ear going, it's okay, it's okay, sweetheart. It's okay. She goes, it won't always be easy, but I'll always be here. I was like, okay, good. <laughs> I'm glad. It's beautiful, and man. And then they went and did some different things. But it was like, it was like, it was a nice rational acceptance of like, okay, this, I'm going to go through some challenging stuff. I'm going, it's going to happen. But, you know, I've got, I've got an ally in this somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. But that I means setting yourself up for that. And that's, that's one of the, I think the beauties of stuff like the Wim Hof method or saunas or just putting yourself in a physically challenging situation or fucking CrossFit, right? Like you're the kind of person that stops two seconds before the, the timer's up or you the kind of finishes all the way through just because every, how you do anything is how you do everything. You know, can you, can you, can you do the breath work every day? Can you get in the cold water? Like just get in it. The step yeah. one, you know, get in it. And it's like, how are you going to handle that? Where are you going to go there? And then when life throws you shit, you're a little more grounded. You know? Yeah. What I do is I just, um, I, I don't do it, but then I just talk about it with a lot of confidence on my <laughs> podcast. And it's like, it's like my body doesn't know the difference. I just, it, 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 it's like all the success without doing the work. You should try it sometimes. Dude, it's amazing. Been, I don't know. I've been doing that for 43 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. It, it is fun. The, the, fun, the fun thing about having a podcast is that it's all out there. So you kind of don't have the, op- I mean, you do have the option to not do it, but then you're just full of shit. Right. <laughs> it's like, man, I'm, have, I'm accountable to all these people now. <laughs> They're going to know. I do do that sometimes though, man. Like I, <laughs> like my favorite, uh, cross training, uh, for big wave surfing is run, swim runs. Mm-hmm. Cause it gets you really out of breath and then you have to manage your breathing as you're swimming around a buoy. And I was really on it before the season for a couple of weeks. And then I kind of fell off and that was just like those moments of feeling falling off. But I kept telling everyone how much I was training. <laughs> it's like, we're going great. Yeah. I've been doing a ton of run, swim runs, but this was like three weeks after I had done my last <laughs> run, swim run. And I was like, <laughs> so I keep a journal and, and in the mornings I'll do journals like, all right, what are you, what have you been up to? What are you proud of? And I was like, I've been doing a lot of run, swim runs lately. It feels good. I'm like, dude, you're lying to yourself in your journal right now. <laughs> this is bullshit. <laughs> did you write that down? I did like, write dude, it down. I'm this, my morning pages are the shit. I love this. Like, so if you would ever, ever want to read them, you'd think I was a crazy person. It's like ask myself real qu- like questions that are really challenging and I'll answer them for myself. And it's like two different people talking. Right. I'm like, so what's getting in your way right now? It's like you. <laughs> like, damn it. There's so much truth in that. Morning journaling has been the most consistent and most helpful practice I've applied in the last five years. Mm. Hands down. I love that stuff. Yeah. Why? What's your uh, method? Like, what do you? What's the morning journal? So it's kind of a just a stream of consciousness piece for me. I started out with more. I just started. I was like, I'm gonna do. It. I have these little, probably laying around here, but little like five by seven journals that are. Like, come, they're a super sustainable. They're made from recycled stuff. But uh, <laughs> I just fucking better be, bro. Yeah, no, dude. They're not getting into the oceans. Um, but no, I'll just get, I'll grab coffee at the at the cafe I work at or work out at the Onnit Cafe right before right in the front of the Onnit Gym, and grab coffee when I go there first thing in the morning, and then I'll sit down and do two pages of just whatever wherever I'm at, and I just put a pen to paper and roll with it. And I like to ask myself questions and kind of get myself 
set up or if I'm going through something, I'll just kind of investigate it more deeply. And my mind kind of runs pretty quick anyways, I guess. I've never been inside someone else's mind that I know of. So it seems like it does. And it helps me get all the things out of my head um, for those two pages. And then I'll do my like, kind of game plan for the day. So I'll make my list for the day in another journal. I like that. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm, I'm creating a journal for this. Mm. I'm pretty stoked on. So I'd love I've, to check it out. Yeah, man. Um, well, I'd love to, I'll send you, I'll send you when I get the, get the last pieces in, but it's, it's essentially, I have a five-year journal as well and it's yeah. called a line a day and I'm on year four now. And it's just five little short lines in a very small journal. Um, but one thing I've really adapted lately is, um, the flexibility of identity. You know, my, one of my mentors, Mark England, who runs po- Procabulary, he has a TED talk out that's really great. He's like, you're, you're, a, you're a verb, not a noun. Hmm. Like you have the flexibility of identity. And I think sometimes it's really hard to realize that because we're just kind of always in whatever state we're in, right? And we reflect on things through some bias and, and pull out what we want to, to confirm what we believe. So I have this journal and, and the days are stacked up. So like, what is the day? February 7th. Like that would be, you know, this is 20, is it 2018? Uh, 2018, 2017, and 2016 are all on the same page, right? So I can see what I was doing this day last year and the year before that and the year before that. Um, And I love that because I look back and be like, man, there's some patterns going on three years ago that are still stressing me out. Or man, that situation I was in really gave me a lot of growth. Or I I did ayahuasca two years ago today, you know, some stuff like that. And you can see that and even like reaching out to friends that you did something with and just like reminding them that, hey, remember that time we did that thing, you know? So I, I did the same thing, but I laid it out in a three-year version, a little bit more space. And then there's a spot to acknowledge gratitude on year one and then gratitude. And then you have to acknowledge some growth on year two and three. So you have to really acknowledge growth from the year before. And I think just recognizing that is really, really impactful. And then understanding the flexibility of your identity and how the way you speak with yourself is really important. You know, the language you use with other people is very important. Like, how do you call that to action? How do you speak your being? And then at the end of each month, there's a a quote or a little like section, a little story even maybe that you reflect on as a current version of yourself and you get to see how that changes. And the quotes are from everybody from like, I mean, Chris Ryan will be in there. Um, Alan Watts, uh, J Cole, <laughs> like it's, there's some really funny quotes in there. And then there's a, this is, so it's just really a, a place. The magic happens in year two. So you can really start to see like, Oh shit, that was a year ago. And there'll be little prompts in there to go back and just, just understand how much you can change. You know, I got a question for you. Yeah. There's something that bring it on. So I, f- I think that by and large, life is getting better for people. Mm-hmm. Um, and y- you're someone who wants to make life as good as possible for yourself. And you make changes in your life that then um, really have results. I found, though, that one aspect of the world that st- environmentally, like, I don't think that things are getting better. Like, for, like for people, it's getting better. But for the world, like, if you look at an issue like plastic pollution, it is getting worse in real ways. Industry is working to get these developing countries to adopt incinerator systems so that they can produce more plastic every single year. <laughs> and they get, r- they get rid of it. So they're, t- they're getting these countries like Indonesia to take out massive loans for uh, incinerators only so that they can uh, produce more plastic the next year. And I feel like we're getting to this place where it, where individual gain is valued so much more than common good. And we all are getting to this place where we're going to be these mindful millionaires with six packs, but nature is destroyed in the process. So, uh, do you think about this? Because I uh, you cl- clearly you care about the world, and I, and I want to figure out like what's the way that we can have both ourselves um, rise up to that that next level of optimization, but also environmentally. Like I, I really believe that we need nature to thrive. Uh, I agree. And, with you, yes. And as a surfer, I'm in nature a lot, and it. And and doing these documentaries about all these different issues um, f- has forced like it, it stresses me out a lot. And and uh, you know when I was talking about like how how far do you want to go in to to yourself or how how far do you want to push it? I sometimes find that I it's easier for me to recede away from the environmental movement because we're fucking losing, and I don't know what the solution 
is to that, to, to get all these people really on board and actively um, working to protect it. Yeah, I think, you know, you said a lot there. To me, it seems, it seems like a, an expression of our current state within ourselves a lot of time as a mass, right? So as, you got to also understand, that's the thing you said about Indonesia and these other developing countries. It's like, I don't think they have the capacity to give a fuck. Like they're just trying to survive. That's like the plastic pollution isn't on their radar. You know, neither is mindfulness. <laughs> neither is, you know, being a millionaire with a six pack. They're just trying to live. And you have to, I think there's compassion that has to be had for them. But also knowing that in our extremely privileged country, like we don't even acknowledge the bullshit within ourselves, much less the bullshit that we produce. We do a really great job of hiding it in landfills and in the ocean where we don't really have to see it. And it's just floating out there and it doesn't really, oh, it's out of sight, out of mind. And we're just going to, you know, even the consciousness community is like love and light, love and light. It's like, let's bring this back to practicality. Let's first acknowledge the that you're full of shit too. Like you, they're, they're, that's there. You can see it. See yourself. Okay, now everybody else is too. And as a collective, we do some pretty fucked up things. And the environment pays the pays the price. You know, this the, the world does not belong to you. I think that's one thing that's that's really in, impactful as well. Like we have this kind of residing belief that we belong. Like we deserve this planet. You know that it's here for us, and maybe that comes from like Christian values or manifest destiny. When we were making westward expansion and wiping out savages, like there's that this we've done some pretty fucked up things. But I think the biggest atrocity what we're doing now is is to the planet, and it is it is crazy. It is it is, and I think it's fractal though. It's just a it's just an expression of where we are at as a collective right now and ignoring our shit. Like it's we were so good. We've so we've developed an incredible capacity to hide our shit from ourselves. It do, it blows my mind. So it, for me, and I'm like, I think about this a lot. It's like, if I can help enough people through what my message to acknowledge themselves fully for what they are, shadow and all, then you can kind of take a more practical look at the collective shadow and all, you know, and I've seen that. I've seen that on DMT. I saw it and it was terrifying. Like just seeing people in the churning and the darkness. Like there's a, a short film on YouTube called in shadow. Um, Dude, it's, it's, it's a great example of what you're talking about. And it will, it shows you in a very artistic way, like how what we're, what we're doing. And it's, it's wild, man. I mean, I'm with you hundred percent, but I just try and do the best I can to help people with themselves. And if they can see them, if I can get enough people to see themselves and share that and, and, and hold space for that for other people, then maybe it, it can move the needle a little bit. Yeah. Helping see all of us with that way. Yeah. Who was it that said we change ourselves so that we can change the world? Or we work on ourselves so that we work on the world. I always really like that because it is it, it is important to um, work on yourself so that you can move out into the collective um, more fully. Yeah. And I just don't want us to stop with ourselves. <laughs> I don't think like, you there's can a, though. Like, there need, can. There's <laughs> radical <laughs> structural shifts that need yeah. to take place, um, and we need to get involved. And I call for a kind of radical environmentalism that we um that we have that 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 will move the needle that like mm. really will change the tide like that is necessary and it can be a very beautiful experience i don't think that transparency is a burden i think that it can enrich our lives yeah and if more people knew if more people just really knew what was going on a substantial amount of them would change. People would also not care, but why can't we just, why can't we just be honest with ourselves yeah. as what's going on? Yeah. There's a great book called switch, how to create change when change yeah. is hard. And it is very much about movements and how you don't need half people, half the people or, or most of the people to create a substantial shift. You need something like 11% of people yeah. to get fully on board and committed and involved for a tipping point to yeah. occur. So I do, have hope in that. And I also, um, am shedding the identity that I once had as a youth activist of like individual action. If we all bring our own <laughs> coffee mugs, then we're going to change yeah. the world. And I do think that that is the thread that can pull on a tapestry and get us more involved in the biggest, th these big issues. But we need to look at the gravity of the tasks before us through a sober lens. Yeah. Um, and, and, not stop with just individual action. We need to get involved politically and think deeply about these issues. That's the word I wanted to go with that was politically. Like I know, so I mean, I live in Austin and, and like plastic bags aren't 
or they're illegal <laughs> to give plastic. I mean, you can't, you can have them, but, um, you can't grocery stores and, and any, any place where you buy anything can't use a plastic bag. Right. That doesn't seem that hard. And it's just is, it doesn't really, it's not even a, it's not a thought anymore. And then I go outside of Austin and they put like every individual item in a plastic bag. And I'm like, what is, what? No, don't do that. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. I can carry that. Leave me like, leave it alone. It's, 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 is there, is there a role in politics or what, what's the, I think a good way to ask this, but like, what's, what the shifts need to happen there in your opinion? Like you've clearly done a lot of thought on this. Like where, where are the limiters there? Well, I think that uh, regarding the materials economy, um, we need to stop externalizing um, costs. So plastic is a great example of this. Like a company can, they um, use a certain amount of oil and a certain amount of chemicals to make this plastic bag or this plastic bottle. Mm -hmm. Um, They sell it at a cheap price and then they're not responsible for that product or what happens to it after that, even if they haven't set up any infrastructure to deal with it properly. Um, So I think that we need to develop a view of a more circular economy. And there is a movement called zero waste. And a lot of uh, communities are adopting this. Um, and these are, these are policies around getting people to compost their waste, getting people to not use plastic in the same way that we, we, um, ban lead in a certain, yeah. uh, uh, one year because we realized that it was affecting our, um, communities. And the other, we're sitting here in LA right now, there was a point when you couldn't see that, that when you could barely see down the street, the smog was so bad. And, the onus and the responsibility needs to be put on the consumer because around that time there were these ideas to create these huge turbines and it was going to suck the smog in and it was going to solve the problem. That's not going to solve the problem. So what, what, and smog isn't solved, but it was greatly mitigated due to smog checks. It was due to us regulating emissions every single car on every single car down the road. And I think that similarly, um, with an issue like plastic pollution, we need to take responsibility for it ourselves um, and get involved on a community level and also really recognize what the solution, what, what the goal is. Like if you, if you want it, you got to ask for it. And the goal is zero waste. It is to live in a world where we can, can be here and leave the campsite a little bit nicer than we found it. Yeah. The campsite of life. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, man, there's something, but how much, and how much better would it feel to be a human being knowing that you're doing that really like on a personal level, right? Cause we are selfish beings and generally speaking, it's like, how much better would it feel to live a life where you knew that was the intention and that you were doing everything you could to do that as a community, as a whole? Yeah. Like that, wouldn't that, wouldn't that just feel like lighter? Yeah. As I said, man, <laughs> transparency can enrich our lives where we know, when we know where our food comes from, when we know where the products that we use come from, that is an enriching experience and no one's perfect. Yeah. Of course, we're not going to have no impact on the planet, but thinking about the decisions that we make in that capacity um, can be a, a beautiful philosophy. And I think that part of it comes back to our legacy. When we yeah. think about a lot of us want to be remembered. Yeah. Right? We want what are, what we said to be remembered. And, and the result of that is people who built skyscrapers with their names <laughs> on, on the top of it. Hang on. Who are you talking about? <laughs> no, no one, no one. But when we think about, I think that one of the uses of recognizing death and that we're all going to die and everyone that we know is going to die. And this conversation is going to be obsolete in some way and no people aren't going to remember us. Then we can change our, like the idea of what we want our lives to be, um, to, to be more benevolent, Mm -hmm. the campsite philosophy, just leave it a little bit nicer than you found it. Um, we don't need to make our mark. Just leave it a little bit better. And I, I, I really liked that. And whether that's the products that we use or the relationships that we um, develop, like even if it's an ex, ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend, <laughs> like try and make it, try and leave it a little bit nicer than you found it. You know, don't <laughs> just like throw it away yeah. and then, you know, well, it's someone else's problem now. Yeah. They're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Take that responsibility. And, and uh, 
And it feels good. It's, yeah, it's not that much harder either. It's just a simple perspective shift. You know, one thing I've said since I was coaching CrossFit, even it was like, just treat every human interaction like it's a human interaction. Like no one's there to serve you. It doesn't matter if they're your server technically. It's like, that's a person. And are they going to be stoked that they had your table? Or are, they just, are you going to just be neutral? Like worst case scenario should be neutral. Like uh, leave their, yeah, leave them better than you found them. Yeah. It's so, yeah. And you can do that just walking down the street, you know? I think you can look at that in so many things. And if you have that mantra in your head, like your behavior will change. That's one of the best things about mantras is that they, if you can get them and they stick in your head like a song and then you find the pattern that with your behavior, well, then that one degree change over the next decade and leaves you in a completely different place than you would have been if you just would have stayed, stayed blind to it. Yeah, man. Damn, dude. How long have you been on here for it? Good conversation. Uh, yeah. Let, yeah, let's let's end it there. I got to pee. Yeah, me too. <laughs> well, dude, it's been great. Thank you so much. Yeah, brother. Really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, me too, man. <laughs> Later. Thanks for checking out the show today, everybody. Just remember, going out into the world, leave it better than you found it. And you know, you can leave the podcast review section on iTunes better than you found it by heading over to iTunes right now, writing a five-star review, and uh, leave some kind words. Let me know what you think. I want to hear about it. And if, uh, if you leave your Instagram handle in the, uh, the comment section, in your kind words, after your kind words, then uh, I'll give you a little shout out. I'll give you a little shout out on the IG. You know, maybe you'll get you a few followers. I don't know. See, it depends on how good the review is. Bring it, see what you got. Bring your best material to the iTunes review section. And don't forget, if you want to work with me one-on-one in the lifestyle design program, Go to livethefuckoutoflife.com, click Lifestyle Design, and fill out the little handy survey to uh, get a 30-minute free call with me. 30 minutes free on the video call, on Zoom, with me, hanging out, talking about you and your life and how you can live the fuck out of it. It's fantastic. Also, don't forget, go for your win.com. Aubrey Marcus's online course is back and it is better than ever. I am running some of the small group coaching through that program, but the program itself, even outside of small group coaching is completely badass. Check it out. Go for your win.com. See what's going on. Find out how to find your mission and deal with resistance that is inevitable in your life when you're moving down the path. Guys, I'm just, I'm sitting in LA right now and I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be sitting here talking to you and I uh, just want to express a little bit of love. I'm sitting in the sunshine right now and, and doing something I really care about. And you guys are all part of it. So, you know, if I could give all of you a review on iTunes, I'd give you all five stars and a bunch of heart emojis, maybe a few fire emojis. <sighs> I hope you all are having an awesome day. I hope this podcast really um, made your day a little better, made your week a little better. Go out and do the thing, guys. Much love. We'll see you all next time. Peace.